Hi everyone, welcome to Photography Chat episode 14. We're just going to get uh, Matt in here and we'll get started. Hope everyone is having a great week. All right. There he is. Hey, Matt. Hey, how's it going? Not bad, man. How are you doing? Fairly well. Fairly well. How's things with you? Uh, I mean, it's been a little bit of a nicer week up here in uh, in Toronto. Not uh, as chilly as uh, last week was, so that's kind of nice. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like 70 here. So it's nuts. Yeah. It's beautiful out. Yeah, it, it was a really nice day today, actually. I went out and uh, shot a bit of film, dropped it off at the lab, and then uh, I've been catching up on some editing and stuff. Hi, Froggy JPEG. <laughs> Welcome. Enjoying. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it's entertaining. <laughs> it, it's, it's always entertaining. So these things have been a lot of fun to do. Uh, it's my 14th episode now. <laughs> Um, it started as kind of like a, a joke with Jason Moore, like three months ago. And, um, yeah, people keep like joining in and people keep wanting to be part of, uh, the, uh, the weekly rotation. So it's been, uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I'm honored. I'm honored. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, no, dude, thank you for, for being part of it. Like it's, it's, uh, so great to have you here and like i mean it was great to meet you in rochester last year yeah. like four times <laughs> yeah yeah back when back when you could like travel and see people and... yeah well it was it's kind of funny because like one of my good photography friends here in toronto leslie um she and i had a couple of trips to rochester planned for this year um that we because it's only like a two-hour drive or something like that from here yeah so, like we wanted to go to Eastman House a couple times, and then like when I drove down there last year, I saw all all sorts of crazy abandoned stuff um, that I didn't have time to shoot then. That I was like, "Well, fuck it, I'll just go back." We'll and... come back. Yeah, yeah. it'll hold... <laughs> it'll be okay. It's like who like, knew the world was gonna end in March? Seriously, <laughs> no. I mean, that was like I I had literally done um, I had done one of the factory tours the week before. Oh, shoot. The week after, everything closed down completely. Wow. That was wild. Totally wild. It, it has been. Oh, and uh, so Froggy JPEG is Zane Pollard's uh, girlfriend. Shout out to Zane. He's a fantastic uh, repairman of all things Polaroid SX-70 and SLR-680. So if you all ever need any of those uh, bad boys tuned up, look for Zane on the Instagrams. He's a fantastic dude. Nice. Um, wow, so that must have been kind of trippy to run the last tour before the world ended. It was. It was. And I mean, it, like, reflecting back on it, there were people from all over, all over the place who came in for that tour. And then after that, you know, total shutdown. So. Yeah, well, it's, I, I've mentioned it before on other episodes, but like uh, a few of us were in San Francisco for um, Policon Bay Area, like the weekend that uh, San Francisco was shutting down. And that was like such a weird experience um, to just be there while like an apocalyptic event <laughs> was kind of transpiring. <laughs> no, it's totally surreal. It's like, okay, I guess we'll like, I guess everybody should like go home and like, yeah, it's just. Well, and a bunch of us were like, should we have come? And then we were like, well, no, this was wildly irresponsible, but also <laughs> it's probably going to be the last normal thing we all do for a really long time. So, and it, it has been like, um, I mean, I've got kind of a weird thing coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, one of my best friends is moving to Vancouver. Yeah. You were saying. Yeah. And, um, she's got a really big dog that is not possible to ship him there. So we're going to be driving across Canada in a little bit during a pandemic. It seems like a really terrible idea. 
but um you know it's it's kind of one of those forced opportunities it's yeah like, I, I guess i'll make the best of it i mean right i think that's sort of the way we're looking at it and it's like it, it's it's all sort of like worst case scenario for like the whole thing because it's like during a pandemic just as winter is about to launch so it's like all the worst times to be like you know driving four thousand <laughs> kilometers across a, okay. a country yeah um but it should be interesting and i'm kind of curious to see what kind of photos i'm going to be able to uh to snap while we go across there have you have you ever done that drive before um so this is going to be my first time going east to west i've gone west to east twice um but I've never gone the other direction. So. Okay. Are you like traveling? Like, are you going to try and see other places or? Well, we're going to take our time just because of the dogs, so we're going to have to stop a bunch and stuff. Um, so not really going to sightsee a whole ton, um, but we're going to stop in Alberta for a little bit. Cause she's got some family there. And then I'm going to try and see um, some of my family while we're in British Columbia. Cool. Um, before I get on an airplane, which is going to feel so weird after not flying for like <laughs> seven or eight months. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, I mean, I was on a plane like monthly in the old world. So yeah, uh, this has been a really weird, like this whole year has been so weird. Cause it's like pandemic. And then I got in a gnarly car accident and wrote my car off and um, been off work basically since may and yeah. Uh, yeah so it's been like a healthy year and then you guys got the election going on right now <laughs> yeah i don't know if we want to make this video about that <laughs> it's gonna get better right we'll just leave it at that hopefully yes <laughs> so we've got a few people um on on the thing here so i don't know if you want to like just do a quick introduction uh of, of yourself for some people that may not know the infamous matt sure um I think some people have dubbed me like Ectochrome superfan. Um, but yeah, so a long story short, at least I hope anyway, um, I'm Matt Stovall. Uh, I live in Rochester, New York. I work, uh, I work for Kodak. Um, I've had the pleasure of working there for uh, going on close to 20 years now, um, which has yeah. been an amazing ride. Um, and, um, and quite frankly, it's, it's, what got me into photography. I was, I joined Kodak doing, um, honestly doing like web design and web development. Um, that was my first gig. Um, and oh, wait, through... sorry. web design and web development like 20 years ago. Yeah. Whoa. So like baby internet times. Total baby internet times. Oh yeah. Whoa. So it was like, um, yeah, I mean, we could reminisce like technology stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it was like, you know, right when like you could actually like type something into a website, you know, where that was like functional and like it became sort of kind of like it could do other stuff than just like show you pictures and text. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, but that time, not to go off on a total tan tangent, but that time though at Kodak was really interesting um, in that space, particularly. Um, <laughs> going to date myself here. So AOL. Yeah, AOL. Right. So if you had AOL, you've got pictures. That was us. Oh, crazy. So Kodak had this whole photo network. Um, and we were the we were basically the technology supplier for photo distribution and all that stuff for some really major systems. So yeah, anybody who remembers AOL and the whole you've got pictures thing, that was that was built on our platform. Plus we had it's so funny cuz um we had uh basically cloud-based uh filters. So this was before, I mean, how many years before smartphones? Um but you had a uh there was a um it was called what was it called? Picture Playground. I think it was Picture Playground. Okay. You you would upload a photo you and then you'd pick which filter you wanted applied you'd upload the the photo it apply the filter and then spit it back to you on the website so then you could oh, save it so it was like super super early introduction to like um 
photo manipulation. And then we're talking like 2002, 2001. Wow. It was, it's kind of mind boggling. That, that is my, that was like still sort of dial up days for some people too back then. It was completely dial up. Yeah. I mean, you were lucky if you had 56, 56K. I mean, <laughs> You know. <laughs> Again, and I, to JP, I, I do remember Lycos, but I was more of an Alta Vista guy. And I CompuServe uh, myself. So. Yeah, CompuServe was great. Um, and I used to use Mosaic all the time before yes. it turned into Netscape. Yep. No, I got, I was big in Mosaic and then CompuServe and then AOL uh, yeah. for a long time. That's wild. A AOL wasn't really as huge in Canada, but I had like stacks and stacks of AOL floppy CDs. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that you'd read <laughs> and stuff like back in the day because it's, yeah, I mean, shit. Anyway, we got a little off from, from photography. Yeah, that, so that's wild. For myself. So, so <laughs> that's what got me into photography was being around all this stuff all the time, though. So I think mean, it probably naturally uh, piqued my interest. And um, I never really taken photography seriously until I started working there. Um, and then um, we, we were, at that time, we were coming out with just crazy new digital technologies. Um, right around that time frame is when like the, um, the 14N hit. Okay. So it was the, the first, world's first uh, full frame 35 millimeter sensor. Um, and so, I, you know, I just got super interested in it. I bought one of our kind of um, prosumer uh, is a DC 4800. If anybody remembers that camera, it had um, it had uh, a computer port on it. Do you have one? No, I, I don't have one, but I have a DCS 760. I'm just going to grab. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, I've I've I have another one of those styles over here on the floor. Um, but uh, DC 4800, it had a PC um, connection, so you could actually. Um, we actually, Kodak used them in kiosks that we made for like Disney and a couple other places. So this camera was actually the camera taking your picture at uh, Epcot and stuff. Um, I say, uh, Tim Anderson, he's, he had one there, DV over DT. That's crazy. Yeah. It's, um, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm not even watching the feed. <laughs> um, yes, I still have mine of the 3.1. That's right. Yeah, and, and you could um, basically, it was a gain control because it's a digital camera. So there was a gain control and you could basically go plus, I think you could go plus three, at least plus two, uh, and then minus two. Uh, so you could overexpose or underexpose. Um, it gave you, and then you could do your own shutter speed, your own aperture and stuff. So anyway, long story short, I, I started messing around with stuff and started getting more and more interested in the, um, in the mechanics of photography. Um, and so I spent a whole bunch of time invested in digital cameras, um, you know, went, went Canon and, and got DSLR. I got one of the, the, the digital rebel. Um, nice. so I've been on that and, and started investing in Canon glass and, um, you know, I ended up with, uh, a Canon 20 D and then a 40 D. Um, and that's kind of where I stopped because, um, as far as work goes, I had moved actually at that point into motion picture. So I was now within the motion picture business and figured I should probably learn a little bit about film, um, given that, you know, I'm actually marketing, trying to market uh, that stuff. Um, so I just immersed myself. That was like one of my first visits to the factory. I was like, you know, let's, I want to go see how all of this stuff works. Oh, so um, up until this point, you'd never been to the factory. Correct. Yeah, I'd never had the opportunity. And so keep in mind, I mean, this this time period, you're talking 2010, okay, somewhere in that neighborhood, 2011, 2010, yeah, 2010. And so nobody's allowed in, right? You, you're only allowed in if you work there. I mean, still, everything is complete trade secrets. We're not inviting anybody to know how we're doing that. Um, you know, the, the competition is still uh, very tight. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and everybody's trying to um, <laughs> remain competitive. So, um, so yeah, I had never been. It's not like employees got invited for fun. Um, and then, 
started working with motion picture uh, and, and had the opportunity to go in there and see what it was all about. And was just like, you saw it. And it's just like, uh, it, I, I can't, I still can't process what I saw that day. <laughs> like it just, the scale and just how immense and the magnitude of everything is just, yeah. Like I, when I think about it, my brain starts melting. <laughs> And you couple that with like the history, the the things that have happened there, and and everything. Um, like the, the wildest thing for me was when you were talking about buildings as machines. Yeah. Like when the historical people were getting all upset that you were destroying buildings, you're like, no, these aren't buildings; they're they're machines that look like buildings. <laughs> like they're yeah, they're not yeah. Used. So yeah, like like the film coding building is, it's really just a bunch of bricks around a giant machine, and there's like. The little, you remember the the, uh, the metaphor that I gave. It's it's like, it's like you're opening up the compartments, the the doors, the access doors to yeah. like a large office fax machine, copier, uh, all in one type of thing. Um, you're just seeing like this little part of it, and you have to literally walk around this entire building. That's it was like what's it nine stories tall and has a basement too, and it's just. There's over a mile of film in the machine. Yeah. Well, that the, the roll coding, um, I don't know, not, it was the, uh, where they make the base. That one was the craziest one for me. <laughs> with, with the elevator and stuff, it's where like, the machine doesn't stop. The elevator just keeps. Yes. There's a lot of stairs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the, um, that particular thing for everybody who's, who's listening, there's, um, it's called a take up. So there's, think of it as like a pulley and so there's two parts to it and when it's running normal they're real close together so that the distance between that pulley is not very big when we want to change over a roll at the end it means like the rolls the roll is totally full and we get it to take it off the machine and then we put on a new core to take up the rest the, the next part because this machine once we start it um it doesn't like to be stopped uh it runs for uh it, they used to run nonstop. They would they would literally stop for um, for the Christmas holiday and the July July Fourth holiday. Those are the two times a year that they would turn the machine off. That's it. Oh. it the, machine is the, the machine that makes the base that they build everything on. So it's like this a is the film base. Yeah, on. yeah. So this take up. Think of it as again as the um, um, pulleys. So those pulleys start to. Um, start to widen the gap widens which means that there's more product going through it and as it widens basically that allows the end to basically come to a stop because it's taking up anything that's coming through the machine they're able to get that roll off put on a new core get it sealed on and then wind it up and start going on that and that and as it winds up they come back together and that's that's like almost a three-story type of mechanism yeah. Huge. That goes up into the ceiling and into the floor. Yeah, it's wild, and you can see the whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's totally cool. Totally cool. Um, if, if you guys ever get a chance, if the world ever comes back online again, to do the Kodak tour, I highly suggest jumping on it if if it ever comes up again. It's worth every penny. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, we we try to make it a good show. Um, where was I? Oh, so uh, motion picture. Um, and then I just so happened to be um, seated next to the PR person for Kodak Professional. So, uh, and then the other two things, I ended up getting a, my father-in-law is a, a photographer as well. Uh, he worked with his father uh, in Syracuse and shot weddings. Um, and so he gifted me uh, his Bronica ETRS. Oh, nice. Um, 120 for folks that don't know um it's a 645 which um you know I, I didn't know the difference at the time but now that i um now that i have shot it's like my favorite favorite format so um so yeah so I, I i was like i don't know anything about this she's like you're probably gonna need some film for that um and her name's audrey young here by the way if anybody in the industry remembers uh audrey she's she's a phenomenal person um knows knows everybody you know steve mccurry like you name it um and and um she's just a phenomenal person um and basically is responsible for me 
uh, getting into film. Um, so I, I owe her, I owe her a debt of gratitude as well as, as my father-in-law and, and, you know, frankly Kodak. Um, but so, yeah, so, so I started shooting, um, with the Bronica. Uh, she gave me some film, um, loaded the first roll backwards, <laughs> <laughs> ended up with no photos. I was really upset about too, because, um, it, happened to be springtime here on the lake and a massive fog, fog bank was rolling in and I was like oh my gosh this is gonna be amazing you know just like cranking it off I'm like oh you know hopefully I got the exposure right not yeah that, oh geez you know loaded the film backwards um so nothing came out uh but it's a good learning experience um well, is that loading it backwards or when you're trying to load it and you're fumbling and the reel falls out and it just like unwinds? <laughs> <laughs> Telescopes out. Yeah. It was like, that, ah, that's like a go. real sad trombone moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've only had that happen, I think, twice. One of them was with, um, yeah, one of them was a, with a roll of Ektachrome. It was pre production. Oh, no. And, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> That's not good. Um, but yeah, so uh, fell hard into film photography because, you know, at that time, a lot of people were uh, spending an awful lot of time in Photoshop and stuff trying to get this, you know, trying to get this look. Um, and and that's when I stumbled across Ektachrome, too, was pretty early on. Uh, and spe specifically Ektachrome VS, um, which we don't make anymore. Um, I've come to find out that some of the components are a little bit more expensive. Um, so I'll never say never because um, I never thought Ektachrome would come back. Um, but on, on the film question, JP did ask about the rumors of film prices going up in the new year. Yeah, I, I'm no going to stay away from any like business. I'll talk about my personal experiences That's fair. Um, and that stuff. I, I, uh, I don't know. Um, I think what, you know, whatever you guys are seeing. Well, um, cause that, that's actually more Alaris than it would be you guys, right? So Alaris, or Alaris, Alaris, yeah. Alaris is setting the prices for, yeah. and this is all I'm going to say. So Alaris is setting the prices um, that they sell their, the film at. We have a price that we set the film that we sell to Alaris. So, I mean, it's, we're the supplier. Um, that's how that works. So <laughs> I, I think I, I remembered bugging you about that last year at the tour because there was the rumor of the prices going up last year and you just explained that like they set the prices because you guys have the contract to just give all of your production to them and then they do whatever with it. Yeah. And again, I mean, how it works is whatever price we're, we're saying it is, um, you know, that's how, that's what a supplier does. Right. I mean, this is, this is like rudimentary stuff. Um, yeah. We supply the film, so we've got a price. They set a price that they sell to, and then subsequently down the line, you know, however many people are involved with getting that to your hand. Um, so there's lots of different uh, opportunities for different prices to be coming down. Um, but I'm not. I I'm not going to comment on on price increase. Sorry. Totally fair. You know. I, <laughs> I know because I've been like bombarded with with uh, IMs and and DMs and and comment posts and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't know any sooner than you guys would. Honestly, I wouldn't. Um, so I don't have any insider information to share. Totally. Right. Fair. <laughs> um, what was I saying? I was talking about. You mentioned Ektachrome. Oh, and... Ektachrome. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's that's when I took off with Ektachrome. Um, and um, yeah, just absolutely loved the way it looked. It it basically, when I got those first scans back, um, that and, and then just seeing the film, because uh, it's a slide. So just holding it up to the light. I was like, yes, that's, that's exactly how I want everything to look. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been... <laughs> I, I, uh, I got a stash of VS that I have been very, very slowly going through. Um, and I only bring it out for very special reasons. Um, actually, 
most often it's it's like family um family family vacation time that type of stuff i very rarely shoot it uh for anything else anymore because i'm down to i want to say like 20 rolls oh wow that's, and that's a, all i got that's not a lot of, of like uniform no no so i'm i'm i haven't shot a roll in well i mean i haven't shot a roll this year with it um i haven't shot much at all this year um but yeah certainly not any ectochrome vs i'm always surprised at like how well some films can do for being like as long as they're stored properly and stuff like um i i found a bunch of this um agfa agfa stuff and i fell in love with this agfa chrome rs 1000 uh, a friend gave me a couple rolls on 35 millimeter and I just loved the way it came out. And um, there's this interesting dude. I don't know if you've ever come across Abraham Vinegar in your travels. Um, I don't know. His father used to run a lot of like the camera market sales and stuff in like Michigan and uh, Toronto and stuff like hmm, that. Okay. And then Abraham took over for him uh, when, when his father like retired and um he's a really interesting cat and he's like one of those people that like if there's something you need to find abraham's like the guy that can track it down for you but those are great people yeah they're fantastic like he he looks for estate sales and all these things and he just buys like massive bulk amounts of like film and cameras and things like that but i picked up a ton of old agfa off of him and some of this stuff it's expiry dates were like 88 91 95 yeah. and the stuff still shoots mint like it's beautiful. I was gonna say that's that's nothing to worry about. Yeah. No, it's it's. I mean, you'll get people get really scared about buying uh, because you don't know how it was stored. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, what I found like the 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 biggest issue with storing film, as long as stuff's not getting soaking wet, um, you know, like massive humidity issues. Um, mm -hmm. you know, as long as that, it can get warm and it can get cold, as long as you're not doing that really fast. And a lot of times, so like if you're, I don't know, leaving it again, leaving it on like your dashboard in the car, um, yeah. you know, these, these temperature extremes, um, as long as you're keeping it away from the extremes. Um, I mean, like I've got a, a a cabinet right over here, and I store the majority of my film there. It's not in a fridge, um, it's not in a freezer. Uh, it's just sitting right there, and I have not had any issues. And it's stuff that's expired, um, you know, fifteen years ago. Um, haven't had any issues with it. It's really stable. Um, and again, you you kind of have to you got to be doing some work to let it get um, to let it get ruined. And even then, I mean, some of the fading and stuff, um, like I shoot a lot of um, expired Portra VS, I'm sorry, VC. And um, it's it's gone a little magenta, uh, <laughs> but but honestly, I kind of like the way it looks. Um, and um, and it's not quite as, it's not quite as contrasty as I believe it, it would have been. Um, yeah. But from a quality perspective, like, it's not like it gets less sharp, you know? I mean, it's, it's provided you haven't gotten fogged or anything. Um, it's still perfectly good. Um, colors might be shifting slightly, but I don't know. I, I feel like that's kind of part of the, it's kind of part of it, right? And, and then with yeah, black and white. What's that? It, it's like the magic with film. Yeah. I, I remember, um, I, I can't remember who it was that was telling the story of the cows that ate the mustard plants that like fucked up a whole batch of film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, it's temperamental while you're making it. That's why not a lot of people make film. So it's, um, and it's difficult to make it in the scale that we make it in, um, yeah. right? So like, um. Sorry, hold on. So um, Eastman Museum, you mentioned them before. Uh, so there's an yeah. amazing, amazing guy over there by the name of Nick Brandreth. Uh, he's on Instagram. I suggest you, you follow him if you aren't already. 
he is the um, historic process guy, one of the historic okay. process guys. And, um, and so he, um, what was I going to tell you about him? Why did I just jump were you into gonna, the story? Were you going to talk about the make your own film course that they have there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. So, so he does, he teaches a class about making your own film. Um, and so he shows you, actually, it's, it's pretty easy. I mean, you make an emulsion, you can coat the stuff, you can, um, you know, you, you've cut the base down, so you're coating a 35 millimeter strip. And then you go and, and, and amazing workshop, highly recommend it. You go and you actually shoot it, right? And then you go develop it and you, you just like, so <laughs> beginning to end, you've made the entire film. Um, and then you shot it and exposed it and you get to enjoy it, right? Um, and so, you know, you, you've made five feet, six feet, whatever, of film. To do that over and over and over again, exactly the same, to get the emulsion to be exactly the same and all that stuff, that's where this becomes a little bit more complex and you, you get the the level of industry applied like you saw during the tour. I mean, it's it cannot be overstated how immense the investment is to make sure that that happens for everybody every time. Well, and just how sensitive it is sometimes, too. Like, I remember when we were in the coding building, they were telling a story about um, some VIPs were visiting while coding was happening and them having a conversation. The vibration from their voices was enough to disrupt the, the film spread or the emulsion yeah. spread. Yeah. So if you think of it, it was basically a waveform that was captured in the emulsion. So if you could That's find a way to play it back, you could actually listen to them talking. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it's uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so crazy. So it's um, yeah. It, 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 to to finish the mustard story. So um, obviously everybody knows where gelatin comes from. So the um, the cows had been uh, sorry. We had noticed something weird going on with some of the chemistry in the film. This was a long time ago. Um, some of the chemistry was was a little weird. The performance in the film was was not what it was. Um, and so they went all the way back up the train to find out what was going on and come to find out that this group of cows had been feeding almost exclusively on mustard. Um, and so the mustard greens, there's a lot of, um, um, what is it, sulfur. And mm -hmm. so that sulfur was showing up in the bones. And so it was translating into the, um, into the gelatin emulsion and messing with the chemistry um so yeah it's it's extremely sensitive i mean you're talking microns right like these silver grains that you're making we do you remember fr from the the uh, we called it the museum the yellow room yeah did you remember seeing that the electron microscope of the silver grains yeah that so was crazy pictures we're able to make those so like tea grains everybody so yeah the awesomeness of tea grains. They're flat tabular grains. So there's more surface area for those grains. So that's the type of stuff that you see in T Max. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, and so that's just one shape, right? So we also make cubes. Um, and then there's other variations of those shapes that we make for each one of the films uh, and each one of the layers. We're able to basically choose the percentage of what shapes of silver grains we want within each layer. So this is where like, this is where it starts to get like, the science becomes magic because to be able to, to, be able to do this stuff and, and to decide what you want that um, collective search surface area to be and the reactiveness of each one um, and being able to mix those things and make it like, hey, I wanted a little, you know, make a little bit more yellow. So you, you can actually do that a couple different ways. Um, but one of those ways is, is by shaping the silver grain itself. So it, it's the types of the, the types of material science stuff that goes on is just like, it's mind boggling. The choices that we're making to create a film. It's, it's truly nuts. Linus, it's happening. Um, 
When you were about to mention something about black and white film, and I have a question for you on black and white film with, with regards to all that magic. Cause, and it also ties in with you said you went into the motion picture part, and that's when it's uh, kicked off all your film stuff. Yeah. What makes Eastman Double X so magical? <laughs> um, you know what? That's That's like... That's one film I don't know that much about. Okay. Um, if I had to guess, it probably has something to do with the silver grain shape. Um, I will dig into it a little bit. I'll go at it. I've always been curious about it because like, it's, it's one of my favorite black and white films to shoot with because it just, it's so crisp and it just so like when when you see the pictures from it you, like you, they almost like pull you in into the image and um like as much as i love triax and and, and t-max yeah. like there's just something different about double x and so i've always been kind of curious about that so. i i will ask about it if again it, an educated guess would be it's probably the the choices that were made around the shapes of the silver grain because tabular grains remember they're they're flat and and that's a chunky piece of surface area i mean granted we're talking microns here but yeah you you end up seeing that stuff um with your eyes because well for black and white that's where you're getting density and then for for color that's what's basically attracting the um um that's what's basically giving you color is there's still a silver grain there and it's still reacting, and that's where the dye cloud forms. So um, if I had to guess, and it is a guess, but um, I would say probably the silver grain shapes. Um, cubes cubes are obviously, they're very precise, um, and so very fine pointed, and, and they're more um, uh, perceived as higher resolution. Okay. Um, I will ask, though. I'm going to make a note. I just always thought because maybe it's just <clears throat> a bit more primo because it's like the cinema stock and, you know, Hollywood's demanding and whatnot. Yeah. No, I'm curious now, too. And and it's the beautiful thing about about Kodak is the people that work on this stuff. They're they're absolute geniuses and they love sharing. Um, that was the thing that I found amazing when we were on the walk is just everyone was just so open about like what and they would get so psyched like share it's like oh you want to hear about it okay yeah <laughs> yeah well like when i first started pitching the ideas of the of the tours people were like do people want to see this i'm like you have no idea <laughs> people people would love to see this um this is like coming to church for some people um it definitely so it's, was. it's like a, a religious experience um you know and and i actually a couple weeks ago, I think I, I, I was sharing online that a couple weeks ago, I actually um, I, I actually was talking to some folks in finishing about the importance of the work that they do. Um, and kind of, and, and so what I did was I, I put out a message saying, hey, anybody who wants to get a message to the people who are working in the factory to make film, um, you know, you wanna give them a, a, a positive message, what would you say to them? And so I got a whole bunch of feedback, some awesome, uh, awesome, awesome uh, folks um, responded. And so I collected all of it and I put it in a bunch of PowerPoint slides and I went and I presented it to them. I'm like, this is, this is what you mean to people. Like you think you're just, you know, showing up for work on your shift and, and, and putting these things in a box and, and that type of stuff. But it's like, it's so much more than that. This is, this is literally, you know, some people were like, I, I want to give you my firstborn child and, and stuff like that. And it's, and it's, um, um, and for a lot of people, it's their livelihood, right? You know, like this is literally what put, puts food on the table. And I was expressing yeah. that to people. It's like, this isn't like, for some people it's, it's, it's a hobby and, and, and the stuff for other people, it's literally their, their livelihood. Um, and, and that's not to say that one is any more or less important to the person. Um, and, and I wanted to just make sure that they, they kind of understood this product is, is something really special. And there's very few people who make this stuff in the entire world. So 
um, they were they were like super appreciative. Um, they, you know, I don't think many of them are film shooters themselves, um, yeah. and so so they're not really connected with the with the the community per se. Um, so I think they they were super jazzed about hearing uh, what the community had to say about it, um, and like super appreciative. Give a round of applause to everybody's comments, and and so it was really great. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I. We, we don't have enough time for me to just keep spouting off all the things that I, how much I love that place. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's really magical. And there, there isn't too many places that like to your point that are making film really, cause it, it's like you guys and Fuji and Lamography and then like a few boutique ones. Yep. Ilford. Yep. Oh yeah. Ilford. Can't forget Ilford. Yeah. I don't <laughs> want to, like, Mike Dane, don't kill me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I I just shot it's some up. Ilford today too, because um, one of my favorite black and white films outside of Double X, I have a really soft spot for XP two four hundred. It's um it's okay because I I grew up it's well I grew up in a place that had like we had a thing called a London Drugs, which is like effectively your, like your CVS, yeah. and that was the only photo lab where I grew up, so the only stuff they, they could process was C41. So my experience with black and white was XP2400. Um, no BW400? Come on. No. Well, I didn't get... I, I missed out on BW400. I, by yeah. the time I started getting into film, uh, it didn't exist anymore. Yeah. Because um, I've only been shooting film for, like, a short short period. Um, digital was mainly where, like, I started from. Like, my mom shot most of like our childhood memory is on film. So it's like, um, I still have her AE one that like my whole childhood was shot on. Nice. Um, but by the time I got into shooting stuff, I, I went digital. Like I shot with a Nikon D 70. Um, that was yep. like my first digital camera. Um, and then I'm like super stoked on this, like chunky boy that I found <laughs> at, a, at a camera show. I, I bought it for 80 bucks. I was like, the prism's worth more than that. Nice. Um, and hold, hold on I, one second. Hold. Yeah, I, I bought it for eighty bucks, and then I spent like two hundred buying a charger and batteries for it because it didn't um, come with it. So, but it works like a hot damn. And the, I, I can't remember what type of sensor it is that's in here, but the way that it renders images, there's just like a there's a different kind of richness to it compared to like my six ten that I've got right now. If that's I. Th I think that's the, um, if I remember correctly, that's got the um, CCD sensor in it. So it's not yeah. a CMOS, not what you get today. Yeah. It's a, the charge couple device. So it's the CCD is, um, many believe, a, a superior uh, capture technology. Um, and there's a long history of, of the sensor wars and all that stuff, which if yeah. anybody's interested in it, you should totally dig into it. Cause it's like, you'll just spend hours, if not days uh, learning about what was going on at the time when Kodak was making these sensors and, and the, the competition and, and et cetera, et cetera. But um, those sensors, by the way, are, are still made here at the factory that has always made them. Uh, they're they're just with a, another company now, but anyway. Um, so yeah, the CCD sensors. Um, I always I agree with you because remember I was saying with the fourteen N, the fourteen yeah. was full frame. That was the CCD. <clears throat> that was that the one that was in the F three, or the fourteen N had a different body. The fourteen, can... the fourteen N had a different body. Okay. So the fourteen N actually had its own. Um, it was basically its own magnesium alloy body. Okay. We that camera, by the way, if anybody has a 14N, they're phenomenal cameras even to this day. The the color, the color rendition, the richness of everything. Um, I I firmly believe that um, this is total hearsay, but I feel like I always, anytime I looked at like a Nikon digital picture, it always felt like what we had done Kodak wise with, with, um, with color renditions and the richness. It always had that, 
extra kind of uh, warmth and, and liveliness to it. Um, again, total hearsay. I have no scientific basis to, <laughs> on that, but it was it, Nikon always uh, always felt like that to me. Well, um, and that was what kind of blew my mind about this guy. And, and Paul, no, this is this is actually a Kodak Nikon digital camera. So it's it's a Nikon F5 body that uh, that Kodak attached a six megapixel CCD sensor onto. And, well, that's even a beefier one. Um, Did you see this one though? The the it's the Pronia. What? <laughs> so that's the APS sensor body, yes. or the the APS film body. Whoa. Yes. So it's an APS camera and then same thing, strap the guts on. That's Sorry, wild. I, I totally stole your uh No no no. <laughs> like it's it's just wild, like because this thing came out like what, like two thousand four or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when they were making they were making those model like there were a couple generations prior to that. Yeah, there was um there, yeah, there were some um, two megapixel ones and like, like yeah. the sport well, and one. There was the, the first one was the one megapixel and that one, that's the one, it was basically the first commercially successful one. It came with a backpack. It was like yeah. a backpack. That was the, that that was was the, the F3 based one, right? Correct, correct. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I get it. It, it was kind of cool that like you, Kodak used the Nikon bodies um, and then some Canon bodies as well for, for some of the different yeah. models. Um, so that was the fourteen N. That refers to Nikon mount. So okay. it was uh, it was a Nikon mount, uh, and then there was the fourteen C, which was the Canon the Canon mount. I'm trying to remember what camera we used for it's, that. One. Um, like this one still blows my mind, like how well it works. The batteries suck when it gets cold because I think they're like Nikon <laughs> batteries or something. So it's like I, when when I shoot with this when it's cold, I have to remember to take the battery out and keep it in my pocket so it stays yeah. warm before. I was in I was in Ottawa. I was in Ottawa at uh, Boule de Neige, if you've ever been. And, yeah. And, and it was Fahrenheit, I think Fahrenheit, negative two degrees. Like it was freezing. And um, and uh, my wife and I were, were um, skating on the canal and, and hanging out. And I brought the 14N. And <laughs> I went out to take a picture. Like I just pulled it out. <laughs> <laughs> that would it would happen with my d70 all the time too i would have to keep the batteries in my pockets and then have like i had two or three batteries for it because like they would if i didn't keep them warm they would just like taper after a few shots yeah. when we'd be like you know in the minus like 20s cold here in, in canada with yeah. insane winters why well, you guys get similar winters in rochester i imagine i feel like I feel like we get, well, I think we certainly get more snow than you guys do. We yeah, I think because on, yeah, on, that on that side of the lake, you guys get a little bit more, which, yep. and it's kind of like wild when I think about it, because like when I look across the lake, because I, I live like, when I look across the lake, like 25 minutes away from like Buffalo, but I have to drive all the way around <laughs> <laughs> the lake to get down there. <laughs> but you know, we used to have a ferry yeah. Not anymore. That's wild. So what, what kind of like, have you been working on any film projects or like anything that you've got like sort of um, on, on your question. mind? Uh, good question. I, um, I've had a long standing project that I'm not really, I'm not really up to the point where I'm sharing that it's a project yet because I haven't That's... figured out exactly what I kind of want to do with it. Um, but I'm always looking for opportunities to to um, to shoot for it. Um, this year, I had a couple a couple instances where I was able to, and and honestly, if you follow my feed, you might be able to guess it. But I'm not going to tell anybody because um, I, I do post some of this stuff. Um, but um, there is something, and, and I kind of want it. I think I want to make it a book, um, and so. I feel like I need to be a little bit more deliberate about what I'm shooting though. Cause it's to, to get exactly kind of the, the look that I want for it. Um, I need to, I need to dedicate some time to actually go and set up some shots. I've been very, you know, just happenstance if I'm driving by or whatever, 
well, I'm going to go just see what it is versus, you know, setting something up and being, being more purposeful with it. Um, I, I think, so, yeah. you know, I might be able to help you with, with book stuff. What's that? <laughs> I think you know someone that might be able to help you with book stuff when you're ready. <laughs> indeed. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I hope it gets to that point. I, I hope I can pull something together because it's got a bit of, um, it's a topic that that is, you know, it's, it's <laughs> I'll tell you like all about it without telling you what it is. It's. Um, I, it's, I think I know because it's the four by five stuff you've been posting lately, right? There's some four, I have some four by, this will throw you off. Uh, okay. I, I, I have some four by five of it. Not a lot. Okay. Um, and that's actually one of the things I, I actually hope to be more purposeful about is to get out and shoot some more four by five of it. Um, it's kind of one of those things that like yeah, everybody just takes for granted. And that's what kind of draws me to, to kind of like studying it. Cause it's just kind of like part of the scenery in most cases. Mm -hmm. And um, nobody really kind of gives it much of a thought. Uh, and I'm always like that, like stuff like that kind of fascinates me. Things like, um, you know, why does a road turn this way? You know, I was like, there's got to be a story behind it, right? Like, okay, simple story of, you know, somebody owned a plot of land or something there. But what if it's like really something cool where there was like, uh, I don't know, an old factory that used to make something awesome or something. Um What's that? I was saying that what's up to Pete? He's uh, the gentleman oh. that uh, that bought um, the uh, the famous Lincoln. Ah, yeah, excellent. Welcome. <laughs> if you um, if you're looking for like a partner in crime for four by five adventures, he'd be a guy to to hit up there. Yeah, I see. That's you talking about it. It's it's like you, like your road trip sounds amazing. I mean, I. I you know, it's some kind of a mission trip, but um, I would love to just tool around and and cut, put a put a checklist of places that I wanted to hit, um, and and go spend you know like a month just traveling around and and shooting. And it would be amazing. Um, but uh, but yeah, so trying to work a little bit more on that. Um, other than that, I I really haven't shot much at all. I've been trying to get out with a four by five a little more uh, just to get more comfortable with it. Cause I really haven't shot that much. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll kind of see where it goes. Uh, now what is it getting cold and stuff? There's going to be less time outside and um, so I don't know. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I have to admit though. That... What's that? Sorry. I would know I was going to ask you about what about you? What are you working on? Um, well, I was just gonna say, I have to admit, I don't have Kodak in the camera right now. I'm shooting some Lomo 400 today. You know what? Uh, it, if <laughs> if you came to like some people, some people really harp on that stuff. It's like, you know what? Isn't it great that we have options, right? Isn't it great that it's 2020 and and we've got options? I mean, I know I've found like my favorites. And it just so happens to be the place I work. Um, yeah. But but isn't it awesome that, like, you get to try all these different things? And that's the only thing I ever push is just make sure you try them all. Because there's so many different options out there. And you might find something that's just like, whoa. Well, it, that's the thing. It, it is so much fun to try things. So it's like, um, as much as I love Eastman Double X, like, it's, like, my main favorite black and white film to go for. Um I have a soft spot for the Ferrania P30 and I've kind of been hoarding mm -hmm. it where I find someone selling it. I'll buy a couple of it just so I can like stash it away because like it pops sure. up and then it disappears because they're like a boutique film producer. Um, and it's a challenging film I've kind of found too, because like it can render some beautiful stuff, but if you don't give it enough light, then it just really makes your life miserable. Uh, <laughs> And then buy them um, all. That's like... <laughs> yeah, right? and I, I bought some of the the washi film stuff. I'm really curious to try that. I haven't done it yet, but there's one. I think it was like a seven ISO film that they recommend for street photography, which I kind of found hilarious. Like <laughs> seven, huh? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's like 
that's like duplicating film for motion picture. I think that's what it is. Cause like, it, it's all these different films. Like some of it's like duplicating film. Some of it is like film for uh, sound recordings. Like it's all of these like weird films that they found like bulk of that they, they repackage. Um, but crazy. it's cool. That, what's that? Sorry. It, crazy high res. Yeah. Like, well, and I guess that's why they produce some of this stuff because even though it's like really weird to work with, once you figure out how it works, you can make some really beautiful things with it. But that's what I find kind of cool about like the film industry where it's at today is like, it's nice to have all these different options. Um, I've been kind of like really digging like uh, Lomography Metropolis the last little bit. It gives like this weird, like, I don't know, almost like, apocalyptic kind of like look to the, the the images sometimes so it's just it's cool that we have all these different options but i always come back to kodak at some point nilford sometimes <laughs> we appreciate it Dude, i i my house is i live like right uh, there's a river that runs north south through the middle of rochester and i live literally right on the other side of the river from from kodak um so it's um i could say that you know, our community appreciates it. So it means a lot. Yeah. And, and someone was asking if the uh, camera club was coming back. So yes, uh, whenever it's deemed um, not a risk to, to, to public health. Um, yeah, it's, it's something I've, I've really missed. Um, it's actually like super depressing. Um, not doing the tours, um, not having the, the intro classes and not being able to do the events that we had been doing. Um, it was like, it's like such a bummer because we just kind of like, we just kind of hit a stride and, and, and um, we're really building up some momentum. Um, and then this stuff came along and, and we basically had to completely shut down. So um, yes, yeah, it will be, I don't know when, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, um, but uh, but yeah, I, I know I know the factory guys. I, I I even pinged them about it not too long ago um, about whether they wanted factory tours to continue, um, and they said, "Oh yeah, absolutely." Um, and so we'll whenever it's safe to do that stuff. Yeah. Um, and there's a question here: Is there an Instagram? And I, I believe it's um, Kodak yeah. Club Rochester. It's yeah, it's um, Kodak Camera Club underscore ROC. That's the Instagram handle. Yeah. I am actually trying to change that <laughs> to just uh, Kodak Camera Club. Um, it's Kodak Camera Club on Twitter as well. Okay. Just, just Kodak okay. Camera um, But yes, if I have any projects, um, I've, I kind of like... In, in, in between projects right now because I had this one project that like I had this idea about but then I was talking to my photo mentor about it and he was like you know what your problem is you fucking think too much you think about all this <laughs> stuff you have all these ideas and you've, you've thought about this whole thing but you know what just go fucking shoot 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 and you'll figure it out and something will come out of it and he's like forget about this idea you made just go shoot 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 I'm like okay fine and I think he's got a point <laughs> Because, like, I look at some of these other dudes that are out there and they spend, like, you know, upwards of a decade just shooting before they amass material to be like, okay, I'm good now. I can find something to make a book out of this or something. Um, so yeah. maybe maybe my crazy mentor has a point. <laughs> there's, <laughs> I'm sure there's one in there. No, it, it, absolutely. I mean, it, that's, I haven't, I think that's why I, I've literally been shooting the subject, um, my subject for forever. Um, like ever since I've always kind of gravitated to taking photos of it. Um, but it's back to my point of like, I haven't been um, focused on trying to like, achieve an objective with it yet. Um, so I feel like I like I don't really I don't really have the project yet, and I still have like a really long way to go before I've got enough material that I feel like is worthy. 
It'll come. But unfortunately, we have the last 20 seconds of the live here. So Matt, I want to thank you so much for joining. It was so great to have you and chat with you. I love you, man. Thank you. I love everyone that joined on. Thank you for like coming on and like, you know, supporting yeah. the photography chat thing. And uh, next week, we're going to have Make and Shoots film on. So yeah. I'm really excited to have her on. And, uh, you know, thanks, everybody. I appreciate y'all. And thank, thank you. you.